it would be orange carpet fibers that would end up breaking this case open. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Krista Lee Harrison. Viewer discretion is advised. Krista Harrison was born on May 28th, 1971 in Orville, Ohio. And at the time of this story, she is just 11 years old. Now, right across the street from where Krista and her family lived was a softball field and like a park. I know that Krista's older brother uh, played softball there. Her family played softball there. It was a park she visited frequently. On July 17th, 1982, she was over at that park um, in the middle of the afternoon with her friend Roy, and they were doing a good deed. They were picking up trash. They were collecting cans off the ground because usually after a softball game, it gets pretty, you know, messy with litter and whatnot. And so they were just being good and responsible and cleaning up after the place. And the park, by the way, was named Marshallville Village Park. Now, at one point, Roy and Krista were kind of separated far apart from one another, collecting garbage in different spaces. All of a sudden, Roy, uh, saw Krista in the distance where a, a man in a van pulled up next to her. And while she still had the bag in her hand, Roy saw this man pick Krista up and basically force her into his van. And then the van sped away. Krista was screaming. Roy would immediately go tell Krista's family who immediately would call the police. Roy described this man as a white male of like normal height. He guessed that, you know, maybe he was 25 to 30-ish years old. He said he had um, a very prominent nose. He had dark kind of curly-ish hair and he could tell he had a mustache. Keep in mind, Roy also saw this person from a pretty good distance. So the, the description may not have been super accurate, but he was able to work with police to come up with a composite drawing of this man. And quite honestly, composite drawings to me always look absolutely terrifying. Uh, and this one especially just looks very, very freaky. He also described the van as being like a reddish brown color. And he described it as having like um, a bubble shaped window in the back, like the back side of it. This was a very small town where this occurred. Marshallville, at the time at least, had a population of less than a thousand people. So naturally, this created a, a wave of panic in the community. Parents immediately stopped letting their children go out. The, the park itself where this happened, no one would go to it anymore. You know, everyone is making sure they're locking all their doors, locking all their windows, and just keeping an eye on everyone. Meanwhile, you got the FBI, you got local police, you got the family, you have a slew of volunteers just going through this entire town, searching up and down, high and low. They are using, they got helicopters in the air, searching, you know, from above as best as they can looking through the wooded areas. They've got people searching on foot. You know, they're using dogs to pick up her scent. They search for days and days. And in not just the town, they, they look out, they branch out beyond that, obviously, for miles. And they come up with nothing. They find no traces of her, no clothing items, nothing just complete she's completely gone they're also keeping a lookout for this van um, and they don't find that anywhere either there was even speculation that maybe this is going to be some sort of ransom kidnapping maybe someone will call demanding a bunch of money so they tap the the family's phone and and they wait and they wait for phone calls but those phone calls never come six days after krista was taken off of that softball field and about 30 miles away from marshallville there were a couple of hunters um, in this kind of wooded area when they found a decomposing body of what they assumed was a young girl. 
They called police, police arrive, and right here in this field, um, kind of next to this like shed, there is in fact a decomposing body um, that is partially wrapped in a, a very large like plastic bag that seems to end up getting like crumpled up. Right by the body is this big brown cardboard box that's basically been, basically it's been smashed uh, and it's covered in blood. And they're kind of, they're branching out searching this area. And while they're searching, not too far away from where all this is found, they also find a pair of men's jeans that is dirty and ripped. And they also find a plaid shirt. And they seem to have just been thrown. They're like, they were just discarded by someone. When the coroner uh, had the body, um, even though, you know, the body was pretty badly decomposed, they were able to eventually identify the remains as that of 11-year-old Krista Lee Harrison. Krista had been sexually assaulted and she had been beaten. And her ultimate cause of death, though, was strangulation. The coroner found strands of orange fibers, they described it as, um, tangled within her hair. And when they looked at these fibers under a microscope, they realized that these fibers in particular were very, very unusual, uh, uncommon, as you would always hear on forensic files, which this case was featured on forensic files. Uh, they were trilobal in shape. I can't count how many times you hear the word trilobal fibers on uh, forensic files. But these, these fibers were so unique that the person who analyzed them recognized them, that they were, that they were the same fibers found um, on the body of a victim eight months prior. Another young girl named Tina Harmon had also been abducted and found brutally murdered. And on her body were those same carpet fibers. Through primarily circumstantial evidence, they were able to uh, identify who they thought was Tina's killer, um, a local farmer by the name of Herman Ray Rucker. And he was arrested, he was charged, he was convicted, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. And it was pretty much a done deal. Like I said, they had those orange fibers, but they were never able to match those orange fibers to anything in connection with uh, Herman. Uh, but they just kind of thought, well, that's just one of those one-off pieces of evidence that we don't really know where it came from. But fast forward to eight months later, now on Krista's body, they find those same exact fibers that they, they traced the manufacturer to like the, this, this particular carpet that sold this. And it was so bizarrely uncommon that the odds of those same fibers being found on two different murder victims eight months apart and having two different killers was so just, it just wasn't likely. It's possible, but it wasn't likely. But we'll get back to that a little bit. Um, then the investigators look at the cardboard box that was found near her body. This was also something extremely unique. Uh, this was a uh, an L-shaped kind of box and it was tall, it was large. And they would determine that it came from a, I guess a Sears, warehouse and the box would have uh, initially contained a, a seat for a van so when they traced the you know the manufacturer and kind of how these are packaged all of those seats that come in those boxes are also uh those seats are put into a large plastic bag when they look at the pa plastic bags they use to pack these seats with the plastic bag they found that was containing krista they were the same bag. So what they did was they looked through the, the Sears basically receipts uh, in all of Ohio to see, you know, who had purchased the, that type of seat. There was a large list, uh, believe it or not, there was a lot of people. And so they had to like meticulously go through every single one to see if, and they had to interview all of those people, uh, which took a long time to do. As this is going on, as they're looking through those records, there is a break, a major break. A 28 year old woman whose name has remained anonymous. She went to police because she had just recently been abducted. 
This woman, she worked at a gas station in the same area where these the two children had been abducted and killed. One night, she was cleaning up the gas station. When she turned around, there was a man there pointing a gun to her head, and he abducted her. Uh, he then tied her up, brought her back to what she assumed was his home. He tied her up to the bed, and then one of her hands was uh, actually handcuffed to the bed. The man shaved all of her hair off, he beat her, severely beat her. Uh, he sexually assaulted her. And he took these like electrical wires that he cut. Uh, so they exposed the inner workings of them. And then he would shock her like repeatedly. He would like torture her. And then the next morning as she's still tied to the bed, she says that the man would crank up the radio um, in his house to full blast so that if she were to scream for help, no one would hear her. Uh, and then he left. And she saw an opportunity and she said, you know what, I am absolutely determined to get out of here while this man is gone. She worked very hard at loosening all of the ropes. Um, she got one of her hands free and then she managed to kind of reach down and, and untie herself at the feet that with were, were ropes. Then she had to do the thing we've all seen in movies before where she had to basically take her hand that was in the handcuff and she had to like squeeze it and pull it um, out of the cuff and what she actually managed to do. Uh, and because she was nude and she couldn't find her clothes, she just grabbed a robe and she bolted from the house until she was able to flag someone down for help. When she goes to police, she actually can tell them who did this to her. She knows the man and it was someone that uh, no one would have expected. He was like this kind of suit and tie guy they described him as. He was a loan and grant specialist for the Akron, Ohio planning department. He was described as kind of like just this nice guy in the neighborhood. He kept his yard nice and neat, always trimmed everything. Uh, his house always looked in order. He just seemed like your typical just business guy. Like, and he didn't really seem to give anyone any red flags. His name was Robert Anthony Buell. Robert was also a, a divorced man. He had a child with his uh, wife or his ex-wife. At the time he was, he had a girlfriend who he was planning to propose to. She herself had two kids that he apparently treated well. He took them on trips all the time. And again, he just seemed like a good guy. But the 28 year old victim um, who went to police said, that's him. He was the one who did this to me. I mean, he was, this was such a bizarre thing for the community because when he was arrested, no one believed it. They're like, this, you got the wrong person. Like this is, he's like, he's a good dude. But police would search his home and they searched his vehicle. What kind of vehicle did he own? Well, he owned a van, a reddish brown Dodge van, the exact same description that Roy had given to police when Krista was abducted. The only difference is, is this van did not have that like bubbled out window like Roy described. It had a square shaped like panel window. When police interviewed Robert's family, they found out that Robert had actually recently replaced the window. He did have a bubble shaped window prior and then replace it with the, uh, the, the the ones that were on the van then. Searching his home, they found a pair of men's jeans that were the exact same uh, brand and type of jeans that they found discarded near Krista's body. They were the exact same size that they found near Krista's body. The shirts that he wore were the exact same shirts size that was found um, near her body, and he owned other very similar plaid shirts. They also discovered that on that list of people who purchased those seats, those van seats, Robert was on it. Prior to Krista's uh, kidnapping and murder, he had purchased from Sears a van seat, and they could not find the cardboard box or the plastic bag or anything uh, in his home or garage. But the most damning piece of evidence, when you open up Robert's van, it is, it's so gross, but it's like, it's just orange carpet everywhere. Like everything is orange on the inside. It's a very distinct and unique shade of orange. And it's a carpet that the investigators had never seen really anywhere before in any other vehicle they've ever looked in. It was just so 
grossly orange. So they took fibers from that carpet and they looked at it under a microscope and it looked very, very, very similar to the fibers they found on Krista. And when they did the comparison, like they put them together, it was like the exact same thing. Uh, they determined that I guess the dyes that were used for that color of orange was very unique. Um, and it could have only really come from this carpet, from this van. And then when they compared the orange fibers from the girl who was killed uh, eight months prior, uh, you know, Tina Harmon, uh, they took those fibers and lined them up with the fibers from his van. And again, they were pretty much a very distinct match. The man who was convicted of her murder, Herman Ray Rucker, uh, well, he was granted a new trial because of those orange fibers. And when he went to trial again, this time he was acquitted and he was freed. For whatever reason, because all they had was that orange fiber and they couldn't, and they didn't have any other evidence to connect him, like with Krista's murder, they had the, the fact that he purchased the van seats and then they, you know, they had the van seat box and the bag, plus the carpet fibers, you know, plus the clothing items. The evidence that he killed Krista was pretty staggering. Uh, they just didn't have enough evidence to actually charge him with the murder of Tina Harmon, unfortunately. After his arrest and after like this news came out about, you know, the him being linked to Krista's murder, uh, then his neighbors started to come out and say, well, you know what, he did and he was a little fishy. After his uh, divorce and separation, he kind of like grew out his hair, grew the mustache, he became like a biker dude. He started hanging out with like kids in the neighborhood, younger people. So, like, now people wanted to come forward and say that, you know what, he may not have been the best guy in the world. So, uh, he would go on trial for Krista's murder, and uh, he would be convicted. And initially, he was sentenced to death. He was also sentenced to 185 additional years because he was also basically tried for all the other, like, crimes he committed within Krista's uh, death, but also the abduction of the woman at the gas station, her kidnapping. He was initially uh, scheduled to be executed in 1996, but 17 minutes before his execution was to happen, uh, for whatever reason, uh, they were able to grant a stay of execution temporarily. But then when his case went back to court in terms of like the sentence, the courts were like, no, just shut up. You're being executed, basically. Uh, and so in 2002, uh, he was executed by lethal injection. Robert was also considered a suspect in the murder of a 10-year-old girl named Deborah K. Smith. Her murder was in Massillon, Ohio. There was also a number of people who came forward eventually to say, you know, about sexual assaults. Um, not only against like younger girls, but also like adult women. Um, and so he was really a suspect in a lot of things. Uh, but the only crime he was really ever convicted of was the murder of Krista Lee Harrison. And while he is still kind of considered a suspect in some of these other cases, he was never formally charged with them before his execution. While they obviously wish that Krista was still here, uh, at least they got the justice that Krista deserved. But that is it for this case, True Crime Aronies. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, uh, if you have tripped, fallen, and stumbled your way into this video, hello, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories here over on YouTube, also over on TikTok. So please feel free to subscribe to me here. Follow me over on TikTok if you want to. The link to that is in the link tree in the description of this video below. Next, if there's a case you want me to cover, please email me. Um, the email is listed below. Just email me the name of the person, where it happened and when it happened, and, and I will add it to my list. I will cover it eventually. I just can't tell you when because I pick my cases at random. So just to be fair. And then next, if you want to support me in any way, I do sell merch like t-shirts and hoodies and a wine glass and stuff. We do ship internationally, so pretty cool, I guess. Uh, but yeah, that's also in the link tree below. And then lastly, if you have a Discord account and you want to join my Discord server, that is also linked below. But please be over the age of 18 or else if you are found out, you will be kicked out. So 
sorry, not sorry. But that is it for this video. True crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry dongs. See, it's working. It's sticking. I know you guys will eventually like it when I call you Dingleberry dongs. <sighs> you don't like it. It's okay. It's okay. I don't like it either. But I can't erase things and I can't take things back. They have not invented the technology to erase things you have filmed. Uh, one day they'll come up with some way of editing things uh, so you can do that. But at the time of this video in 2023, America, they still haven't invented the technology. It's crazy. Am I lying? I might be lying. Um, maybe it's just time for me to go now. Okay, so. <laughs> bye. That was stupid of me to do, but I did it anyway. Uh, bye. What was this? I don't know. Okay. <laughs>